Holy God, open our eyes to your presence. Open our ears to your call. Open our hearts to your love. Amen. On this third Sunday of Advent, now past the halfway point of our journey through the season, we have a heightened sense of excitement and joy as we approach the coming of the Christ. This Gaudete, Latin for Rejoice Sunday, is where we find ourselves, and the message of rejoicing is exactly what we've heard today. From Zephaniah, sing aloud, O daughter Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord your God is in your midst. And from Paul's letter to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The Lord is near. And all this sounds great. Rejoice, spread the joy until we are confronted with our gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm experiencing a bit of emotional whiplash in response to our reading from Luke's Gospel. Because truly nothing says rejoice, like John the Baptist shouting to us, you brood of vipers. Admittedly, I don't really or readily associate brood of vipers with the word rejoice. But here we are. So in a continuation of last week's gospel, we're back with John the Baptist, proclaiming repentance, echoing the prophet Isaiah's words, prepare the way of the Lord, and reminding us that all flesh shall see salvation of our God. John is raging in order to punctuate the importance of his message of repentance the importance of seeking and returning to God. If last week's gospel was a call to repentance, then today's is a call and a demand for action. For the word of God always seeks from us a response. And that is exactly what John the Baptist demands of those who come to him. However, his greeting is less than warm and comforting. You brood of vipers, you sons of snakes, what are you doing here? Some gathered probably wanted to lean on their religious and heritage, the ways of their ancestors. But when I was growing up, and I am of a certain generation, when you met someone, it was not uncommon to be asked who your people were. For in knowing a bit about your family tree, others would try to gain insight on how you may have been raised, what your values were, what was important to you, and perhaps the sense of your character. But John the Baptist is not impressed by any of it. He basically tells the crowd, it isn't just enough to call yourselves the people of the covenant. Don't tell me who you are. I don't care how you, who your family is. I don't want to know your lineage. So don't rest on the laurels of your ancestors' faithfulness. Show me who you are. Show me your repentance. And John calls those who come to him to be baptized to conduct their, conduct their lives in a manner reflecting their conversion challenges them to bear fruits worthy of repentance. Now, did you notice the reaction of the crowd? I mean, John just called them out, puts them in their place, goes on a rant. Yet, what is the crowd's reaction? You'd think they would be reaching for some rotten fruit to throw at him, 
but they don't. Instead, they ask what they should do. Let that sink in for just a moment. They ask, what should we do? Sometimes that question comes out of consuming guilt, at other times out of pure helpless desperation. God, what should I do? Show me the way. And while I do not know the source of their motivation, what should we do is what they ask. And John tells the crowd to share their food with those who are hungry and have none. If they have two coats, they are to give one to someone who has no coat. It is not hard to figure out. To the tax collectors, he says, act fairly. Be honest in your dealings with other people. Do not take more than you are owed. And he tells the soldiers not to abuse their power, not to manipulate others, and not to create more victims. And for the tax collector and the soldier who are government workers, they are being asked to do their jobs with honesty and integrity, not to use their position to the detriment of those they are supposed to serve. It is interesting to note that John did not tell any of them to go do or be something different in that sense. Instead, he called them to be who they were, but in a different way. He didn't tell the tax collector to go find more honest living. He asked of them to be honest. He did not tell the soldier to stop being a soldier, but to be a soldier who respected others and who understood the power and the danger of holding power. He called the crowds to remember that their life is bound up with their neighbor's life and that there's no room for indifference or complacency or selfishness in giving. John the Baptist tells them to have a moral compass, a life code, a clear, lived-out agenda of faith in whatever they were doing, wherever they found themselves. No excuses to the crowds, to everyone then, and by extension to each one of us. There is a simple message. Share, be fair, don't bully. A lesson that has resonance for us today. John's words invite us to examine our personal actions that stand in the way of a deeper relationship with God and all of humanity. Through repentance, John wants all to seek a deeper and more profound relationship with God and to examine what stands in the way of that relationship. Perhaps the joy or rejoicing in John the Baptist's message is that our present condition does not have to be our future reality. For repentance is not just about us in an isolated way. It is connected to and happens in relationship with God and our neighbor. It always restores, enhances and gives life. It is not about escaping the circumstances of our life, but engaging those circumstances in a new and different way, in God's way. You see, real change, transformation of heart, does not begin with the world around us, but the world within us. It means changing the direction of our lives, means inner change, a change of our way of being manifested in how we live. Likewise, our words and actions must point and arise from a very different way of being, a different way of seeing, to see others as human beings, as holy, as created, and loved by the same God who created us. We are called to open our minds, soften our hearts, 
and turn our lives in a Godward direction. That is our Advent work, and it is important work. For the God who comes, the Christ, the one who is more powerful, is coming to all humanity. The last verse of our passage from Luke's Gospel tells us, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Ultimately, John's warnings and exhortations to this brood of vipers, yes, us included, equals good news. As he points to the one who is coming. And so we too ask, what should we do? We can be empowered by John's harsh sounding message. We can take Jesus' acts and attack the root causes of poverty. We can take Jesus' winnowing fork and do the advocacy work to separate truth and goodness from oppression and greed. The Holy Spirit can set us on fire to use our voices, our power and privilege to challenge injustice as long as we have the courage to see it. My brothers and sisters and siblings, repentance is messy and uncomfortable. It doesn't necessarily mean problems are solved when we turn around. But as faithful followers of Jesus Christ, we know that he will meet us in the gap because we know Jesus' ministry is all about forgiveness and healing and reconciliation and love. This is good news and the Advent message. What should we do? In these last days of Advent, as we see the light of the world drawing nearer to us, May we allow our hearts and lives to be transformed and rejoice in that. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, for the Lord is near. And may we sing aloud, for the Lord our God is in our midst. My friends, rejoice. Amen.